Okay, so welcome everybody to so today's headlines. So today, as usual, we have two speakers. Our first speaker is Yun Yang, and Yun is a pre-doctoral fellow here, uh, and she's spending one and a half years at CFA, and a bit more than one year has already passed of that one year. So here in CFA, Jeremy, Jeremy Drake, and Jason Kong are her advisors. Uh, she's also enrolled at UMass as a grad student. So Yun's research is focuses on time domain X-ray observations and modeling of accretion structures in binaries. And today she's telling us about X-ray pulsars in the Magellanic clouds. Uh, hi everyone. Um, uh, I'm here to talk about uh, the uh, comprehensive library of X-ray pulsars in the Magellanic clouds including the time evolution of their luminosities and uh, spin periods. <clears throat> I will start with, <clears throat> with an introduction to the library of pulsars in the Magellanic clouds, like the satellites and the number of observations we used, also the content of the library, like the event lists, light curves, kilograms, and the spectrum. Uh, the reason we study pulsars in the Magellanic clouds is that uh, Neutron stars still potentially hold many unsolved problems. The low absorption and the low distance of these galaxies can help us easily categorize the luminosities of these pulsars, which can help us to understand the process of accretion and X-ray emission in high-mass X-ray batteries. Later, I will give two examples of our archival products with the three satellite compilation, SXP, 348 and the SXP3023. Uh, following this database, I will show an example of the post-profile modeling for SXP504. And, and at the end, I will introduce the pulsar candidate we found in a younger galaxy, IC10, in order to form a comparison sample for the Magellanic cloud X-ray pulsars. <coughs> So positions result from the rotation of the magnetized neutron star, and the modulation arises from its binary orbit. So a pulsar is a member of a binary system with a normal star. The gas transferred from the companion can spin up an old and slow pulsar. This animation zooms into a neutron star and its accretion disk to show a Miller second pulsar in close up. <clears throat> so we have created a library of pulsars in the Magellanic clouds. We collected and analyzed over 1,000 of X Newton, Chandra, and RxC observations. It uh, covers 15 year detection. So X Newton and Chandra detection are from 2000 to 2014, and all of the RxT weekly observations are from 1997 to 2012. So for each pulsar detection, our pipeline generates a suite of useful products. For example, the single source event lists, pyrograms, light curves, and the spectra. So for each person, of the number of observations we used from the three satellite is showing in these histograms. The pulsars are arranged in the order of increasing spin periods in seconds, as their names indicate. So the green bars mean how many times each person was in the field of view. And the red bars show how many times each person was actually detected. <clears throat> so similarly, this is the histogram for the Chandra observation. And uh, this is for the RxTe. Uh, we can see the fast pulsars are rarely detected. Overall, for all the lower pulsars, we have put off the luminosity from the three satellite in this diagram. The XM Newton observation is plotted in green, 
Chandra is in red and the RXT is in blue. The field symbols mean the positions of the pulsars are detected, and unfilled symbols mean their positions are not found by us. Also, the no positions are found in the propeller region. This, the faintest source and the brightest source map out the boundary of the X-ray emission in the small Magellanic clouds as 10 to 31 to 10 to 38 arc per second. <clears throat> Individually, we have put the uh, three satellite measurement together. For example, let's look at this pulsar with spin pure 348 seconds. <clears throat> so this is XP348. Still, different color means a different uh, satellite. And the blue dots mean RXTE detection. Chandra is in red and uh, X Newton is in green. We have uh, 17 year history of the luminosity, past fraction, amplitude, spin pure, and the significance of the long schedule period we found. So obviously, RXT doesn't have the past fraction information because it's a long image detector. There are always multiple sources in the field of view. And the field symbols indicate the Sources positions are detected with larger than 99% significance. So this can tell us the on of status and outburst state of each person as a function of time. The linear fate to the spin period shows this person is spinning up with a rate of 0.2 meter <coughs> second per day, and uh, which is illuminating the uh, mass and angular momentum transfer from the a creation disk or wind to the neutron star. And the standard duration is 3.5 seconds. <clears throat> uh, in a similar fashion, this is uh, SXP3023. The data points of the spin period are also show a period modulation. So we found that its orbital period might be 4.2 years. Uh, we have similar figures for 17, five, uh, 57 other persons uh, will not be present uh, in this talk, but here is a table to summarize the spin period derivative information. So the first column is the name of the person, and the second column is the spin period derivative information with the error bar, and this is the standard duration, this is the significance. The last column is the number of points used to do the linear fit for the spin pure derivative. And the, the spin pure derivative information, uh, the, its uh, magnitude is also plotted as a function of the spin pure. They are all, all, all of them are located in this region. Uh, <clears throat> Besides, uh, all, uh, so t overall we found uh, uh, long term spin up and down trends are seen in 28 and 25 pulsars respectively. We have also added the spin up and down information into this uh, COVID diagram. The green means the pulsars is uh, spinning up and the red shows this pulsars are uh, spinning down. The blue dots mean this pulsars uh, spin pure derivative information are still unknown either due to lack of observations or lack of positions detected. And the bottom, this open symbol means this process uh, orbital periods are still unknown. Uh, currently, we only have 43 out, out of 65 persons have secure orbital period. The relationship between the orbital period and the spin period can be matched by a parallel. The index is 0.425. So this can tell us that the longer the orbit and the wider the binary the long the longer of the orbital period, the wider the binary orbit. Hence, the lower mass and the angular momentum tra transfer occurs, and finally, the pulsar rotates slower. So besides the spin period, we have also did a statistic study for the positions. 
The left is the number of positions detected as a function of the X Newton epic PN photon counts. The distribution of detected positions peaked and around 300 counts and represents the complete limit of this survey. So therefore, observations should be designed to obtain at least 200 counts when search for periodicities. On the right, it's the number of positions detected as a function of the path amplitude in the unit of count per second. <clears throat> uh, similarly, this is for the Chandra. And we can say it peaks and uh, 0.06 counter per second. So the same as X Newton. And this is uh, RxTE. So this can guide us for our future observing proposal about the sufficient counts needed for, uh, for the observing time. We are also working on the relationship uh, between the luminosity and the past fraction for each person. So the variation of the past fraction shows two different trends as the luminosity increase. So for example, this is the SXP3023, the past fraction uh, decreases as the luminosity increase, but the SXP50 lies short opposite direction. <clears throat> Based on our, our archive, we have also built our preliminary model with the general relativity effect. Sorry. The upper left is a geometry demonstration of the neutron star. The arbitrarily sized hot spots is plotted in red, while the blue dots demonstrate the center of the pulsar. The magnetic axis stands the goes through the center, and the black line means the photon pass, including the light bending effect. With this light bending effect, the visible region of the neutron star surface is significantly enhanced, so which can be expressed in this formula. R is the radius of the pulsar. R over Rg is the emission radius in Stewart's child units. And the infinity, the flux, is reduced by the gravitational redshift factor Zg. Uh, which can be expressed uh, in this formula uh, as a function of the mass radius ratio. The observed flux fraction from the one emission spot is uh, related to the emission radius and the angle between the magnetic axis and the light of sight. So the different model parameters combination generates different uh, shapes of the possible files. The model, the light curve from the primary hotspot is uh, plotted in pink. The second hotspot is in green. The both hotspots combined in black. The upper panels are for the pulsar with uh, symmetric hotspots. And the mid and the bottom panels are for the same pulsars, but just the second hotspots shifted uh, in the location. So when both hotspots are visible, the observed path shows a plateau. The maximal past fraction is showing in this formula. Uh, this is for the symmetric hotspots. If we want to have, uh, have a larger value than this uh, past, frax, uh, past uh, fraction, we need to we need to have. A, uh, the person needs to have asymmetric hotspots or more than two hotspots. On the right is an example for the past profile modeling <coughs> SXP 504. The colored map is a reduced chi square between the 2003 December 14 XM Newton observation and the model. The beta is the angle between the magnetic axis and the spinning axis. The angle between the spinning axis and the light of side is theta. So this angle are divided into four different class, classes. 
uh, these light curves are the examples for each class. So we can uh, say at the minimal reduced chi-square, the best fitting angle is theta equals 15 degrees and beta equals 64 degrees. The redshift factor equals 0.11. With this result, the upper left shows the comparison of the fold light curve between the model in red and the observation in black. And the observed and modeled the long scale pyrogram is showing in the bottom left. So, <clears throat> so far we have talked about the pulsar population and the modeling in the uh, magellanical clouds. Uh, in parallel, we also searched the pulsar candidates in a younger galaxy, IC10, uh, to form a comparison sample with the magellanical cloud X3 pulsars. Since IC10 is the closest known starburst galaxy, and uh, it is much younger than the small and large magellanical clouds. We search the positions with a uh, very deep XM Newton observation. Uh, we found uh, uh, a few pulsar candidates in the direction of IC10, which are labeled in green circles in this imaging. <coughs> Uh, therefore, we conducted the optic counterpart survey with the Macy catalog, and we also observed uh, uh, IC, uh, IC10 and the National Optic Astronomy Observatory in Arizona. Uh, the yellow is a field of view of our optic observing. Uh, first, uh, we, were audit, we were awarded uh, two lights uh, observing time with the hydro uh, multi-fiber spectrography and the VN 3.5 meter telescope, from which we obtained the spectrum of 55 bright and 98 uh, faint sources. So here is an example of the uh, raw data, which can be used to uh, determine the radio velocity and identify the uh, spectral type and their membership. <clears throat> uh, we also did the um, observing with the KT Big 4 meter telescope. <laughs> we get the broad, broad and the Lanzo band uh, optical imaging. So here is the uh, 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 reduced H alpha imaging with the uh, exposure time of 2.9 hours. It is centered uh, under the center of the galaxy IC10. Now we are still working on, on the identifying the optical counterparts of the pulsar candidate uh, in the direction of IC10. So <clears throat> finally, we have uh, collected and analyzed all the lone pulsars until 2014 in the Magellanical Clouds with the three satellites combination, XM Newton, Chandra, and uh, ArxTE. In the small Magellanical Cloud, we found uh, 28 pulsars spin up and 25 spin down. Now we are working on science using this library. Uh, for example, figure out the trend between the luminosity and the past fraction. We have created a preliminary model. Next step, we would like to incorporate uh, more complex phenomena into our model before fitting it against uh, the entire library. <clears throat> so that the uh, resulting database can be used for the future theoretical work. And we also uh, find a few PERSA candidates in IC10. So we would like to further identify their optical counterparts so that, so that uh, we can compare the pulsar population into the different uh, galaxy with different ages. Thank you. Thank you. So, are there questions? Yeah. Uh, can, can these pulsars be observed in the radio? Yes, yes. I see. Yeah. 
Um, but it's it's uh, it's a bit far. I'm, I think so. But I'm, yeah, yes, yes, it can. Uh, this just uh, this way used the pencil pencil bin. So the the equation columns as a fan bin and the pencil bin. So this way. Yeah, we we trained the like your. So are you talking about the the beam pattern of the yeah, equation column? I mean, this is alpha. Yeah, that's alpha. Yes. So, um, since we are fitting the model with the real observation, it's uh, I think the alpha. If if different per, uh, per size alpha is different. So, um, I think. I think it's I I if we. Like we fit a one person with, uh, for example, SXP 3023, there are more than 20 observations. We fit all the light curves. Uh, we found the, there's an alpha distribution, but the, it peaks and, uh, and the, so we can find the best uh, angle. It's, it, I think it's different with a different process. I'm not sure if I, I understand the question correctly. investigate had actually out for history of the galactic center of massive black hole Sagittarius A. Uh, and for this study she mostly used the new star telescope. Sorry. Is this the converter? Uh, no, no, no. Sorry. I should use it? this one. Will tell us about probing cosmic rays in the galactic center. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's fine. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, just let me um, talk about a slightly different topic on um, some new channels to probe the cosmic rays in the uh, central region of our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, so the origin of the galactic cosmic rays has remained a big puzzle in astrophysics for many decades. And especially there, has been, uh, there have been a lot of efforts on looking for evidence of the, for the existence of cosmic ray particles in the very central region of the galaxy, the galaxy center. Um, so luckily we're not sh short of uh, good targets to probe for the high energy particles because the galaxy center harbors uh, a lot of like very dense and very massive uh, molecular clouds. And uh, these clouds actually generate very bright, they are very bright uh, gamma ray sources, which have, has been interpreted as, uh, do, uh, as is due to like a hadronic process, uh, i.e. the PP interactions. And uh, 
the pi zero decay will give rise to the very bright gamma ray emissions along the uh, galactic plane tracing these molecular materials. Uh, at the same time, uh, the cosmic rays uh, particles, either electrons or protons, in the lower energy range, i.e., like say, uh, let's say MeV to GeV, they can also like uh, bombard bombard into these molecular uh, clouds and uh, generate X-ray emission through the uh, Bramstrong processes. Um, so besides these uh, like giant molecular clouds serving as targets for the high energy particles. We also have some quite unique magnetic features, magnetic structures in the galaxy center, which are called magnetic non-thermal filaments. Uh, they have some like locally uh, enhanced magnetic field strength within these structures compared to the surrounding environments, and they could potentially trace, uh, track the uh, high energy um, particles if there is any, uh, and generate uh, radio and X-ray uh, synchrotron emission. Uh, so just a list of these uh, three items here, and in this talk, I'm just going to focus on uh, these two, i.e. the probe, uh, probe the GeV TV electrons using these magnetic filaments and to probe the MeV to GeV uh, particles using the molecular clouds. And first, let me just uh, uh, unfold a little bit on the, on the first one to probe GeV TV electrons using uh, magnetic filaments. Um, so one of the most uh, striking features in the galaxy center uh, is perhaps these uh, very elongated uh, features uh, given the name of like non-thermal filaments because they emit uh, non-thermal uh, emissions. They are firstly discovered in the radio band uh, in the 1980s. And here are these two images on the left shows the 20 centimeter map and a, a six, centimeter, six centimeter map of the galaxy center. And you can see these guys. Uh, very elongated, very long uh, features, and also um, some smaller scale, uh, shorter filamentary structures. And this is a, a six centimeter. And since the uh, start of the Chandra era, uh, some uh, smaller scale elongated features in X-rays have also been uh, detected, although of a, a smaller uh, length. This table just uh, uh, gives a comparison between the radio uh, elongated filamentary structures and the X-ray filaments. Um, there are about like 80 of the radio filaments within two degrees of the galaxy center, or there are a smaller uh, amount in the X-rays, about 20. But new uh, X-ray filaments are being uh, discovered in the recent years. Uh, also, the, as just uh, uh, talked about, the X-ray filaments uh, tend to be uh, of a smaller scale, like a few parsecs, while the radio filaments as shown here, can extend up to tens of parsecs. And thanks to the polarization detection in radio band within these filaments, it kind of helps to confirm the synchrotron origin for the radio filaments. And to generate a synchrotron radio emissions uh, of these, uh, within these filaments, uh, for, for, uh, and their uh, flux are kind of a, a constant over the years, uh, it, it requires to feed these filaments uh, continuously with uh, GV electrons. And the ultimate question is, of course, of course what is the uh, regions of these uh, GV electrons? Is it due to uh, particle acceleration? Or more exotically, could it be due to dark matter annihilation? And if it is due to the particle acceleration, what is the, uh, which is the accelerator? Is it, is it the central supermassive black hole, or could it be like supernova remnants or pulsar wind uh, nebulas? Um, but of course, uh, there hasn't been any X-ray polarization detection uh, for, for these uh, kind of sources. Um, but but if, it, if the X-ray filaments are of similar origin as the radio filaments, uh, namely the uh, synchrotron emission, uh, it will require the input, uh, the input of TV electrons. And of course, that would also uh, lead us to the question, uh, what is the origin of the like, TV electrons in the galaxy center area? Tubi, could you tell me the scale of this map? Sure. I, uh, it's uh, it's yeah, just a few arc minutes. Um, I would say it's like 10 parsec, 10 parsec or something. 10 parsec or something. Ten, ten parsec ten or something parsec. I think. Oh, yeah, I think so. 
Okay, um, so let me just uh, give uh, a, a, an example. Uh, this guy called uh, Saji E or some uh, telephone number name, like Newton. Newton. Um, this is the brightest uh, uh, X-ray filament in the galaxy center uh, area as shown uh, this, uh, in these uh, two uh, images. This is the Chandra 2 to 10 keV, and this is the uh, New Star 10 to 50 keV. Um, the, the about 20 uh, X-ray filaments used to be interp interpreted as the P uh, positive wind nebulas, the PWNs. And this guy is also, the SAJE is also, uh, was used to be uh, interpreted as the uh, uh, PWN. Uh, this is the putative like pulsar leading the uh, nebula uh, behind it moving that way. Uh, but the uh, new star detection showed that the high energy 10 to 50 keV uh, centroid uh, does not over, um, coincide with this uh, putative pulsar, but instead uh, co coinciding with like the a brightest spot of the like 2 to 10 keV X-ray emission, which is very far away from pulsar, kind of arguing against uh, that uh, pulsar wind nebula scenario with the pulsar uh, leading the nebula moving this way. And also the recent uh, radio image also reveals some very striking features within this filament. Uh, this is the radio uh, counterpart of this, uh, this source, the Sagi E. As you can see uh, that this is, it contains many like uh, subfilaments, uh, just uh, like a bundle of many subfilaments entangled with each other and extending to a larger scale. Uh, this is definitely not something uh, typical for a positive wind nebula. Uh, it's, it's more likely due to, it's just a magnetic features and the particles just a, a spiral around uh, tracing the uh, magnetic field lines and giving rise to the synchrotron emission in radio. And that, let's just look at the uh, broadband X-ray spectrum of this source. It's basically just a, a featureless, clean, um, absorbed power law extending up to 50 keV. And if we compare the X-ray spectral index and the radio spectral index, uh, they are consistent of, uh, with the picture of synchrotron emission from radio uh, all the way to X-rays. Um, so uh, if we uh, consider the magnetic field strength within this uh, filament, which is about like 100 to 300 microgauss, that is one order of magnitude higher than the uh, surrounding large scale galaxy center magnetic field strength, then we, uh, it will require um, the input of, 100, of electrons with energies of 100 to 200 TeV. And again, what could be the origin of uh, such high energy electrons? Uh, and what is the accelerator? So uh, back in our like uh, earlier paper in uh, 2014, we kind of like proposed a uh, uh, kind of a wild hypothesis of one possible origin for the uh, hundreds of uh, TeV electrons, uh, because this uh, some many of the X-ray filaments and radio filaments are kind of associated with uh, the molecular cloud. And uh, we were thinking if there is indeed a very powerful uh, cosmic ray accelerator located in the galaxy center area, no matter what it is, and it could uh, accelerate the particle protons to like TV or PV, then when these uh, um, TV and PV protons hit onto the molecular clouds, then the PP interaction, uh, due to the PP interaction, the pi zero decay will give rise to the gamma ray emission uh, like detected in the, uh, by like Fermi or Hess. Uh, at the same time, there will be also other secondary particles uh, generated by the PP interaction, like the secondary electrons. And the energies of these secondary electrons would, will fall into TeV for primary PV protons, and it would be, the secondary electrons will be GeV energy for the primary TeV protons. And if, they, if these secondary electrons can escape from the molecular cloud, they, they could be uh, tracked uh, within these uh, locally enhanced magnetic field within these uh, filaments. But these, uh, the, these filaments have to be very close to the molecular clouds before uh, like TV electrons cools off. Um, and uh, within the filaments, uh, these uh, electrons can generate synchrotron emission 
uh, falling into X ray band and radio band as we see here. So this is just uh, a, a proposal. But of course, um, there are uh, many um, uh, things to, to that needs a very uh, careful investigation, such as um, what is the spectrum of the uh, secondary uh, electrons, and it, can they really escape from the cloud uh, by comparing their cooling time and escape time within the cloud? But maybe the more important question is: Is there actually a, a powerful enough uh, cosmic ray accelerator out there in the galaxy center? And th then. Uh, there came this uh, nature paper uh, by the Hess collaboration last year um, that they basically accumulated many years of the Hess observation of the galaxy center and along the galaxy plan, and uh, they fitted with the, uh, the the spectrum TV spectrum with the uh, hydronic model, and it turns out that uh, it requires the uh, primary the protons uh, up to a few PeV. So they they kind of uh, uh, the title of the paper would be. It, something like, is there a, a pavotron, uh, or evidence for a pavotron in the galactic center? The other uh, findings of them uh, presented in that paper is that the gamma emission along the galactic plan uh, falls to a 1 over R distribution, so which points to maybe a single cosmic ray uh, accelerator uh, at the very center of the galaxy, which is actually uh, coincide with the central supermassive black hole, such as star. But of course, other sources within this area, like a supernova remnant and the PWN, cannot be ruled out. But this is just uh, gives us some uh, good, good news that there is likely that there is indeed a very powerful uh, cosmic ray accelerator there. Um, so, uh, but um, next step, uh, my next step would be kind of like, I would like to identify more um, uh, X-ray uh, magnetic uh, filamentary structures, and on the other hand, uh, we can build a like a PV cosmic ray proton and the cloud interaction model that can be applicable to these galaxy center giant molecular clouds, and we can calculate their secondary electron spectrum and to compare with those required by the magnetic filaments to see whether this scenario is self-consistent. And of course, future uh, X-ray polarimeters, if um, I mean, based, based on their performance, if they could measure, uh, actually, uh, they could detect some linear polarization uh, in the X-rays from this feature that would confirm the synchrotron origin in the X-rays. So that's about my uh, the first topic, what I would like to talk about. And uh, secondly, I would uh, like to um, introduce a little bit on how we, can, we could probe the another population of the cosmic ray, the MEV to GEV particles, either electrons or protons, using uh, the molecular clouds. Uh, here, uh, I want to show the uh, structure of the molecular uh, clouds in the center. Basically, uh, this is a scale of like 200 parsec. It, this is the center of the galaxy, such a star is here, the supermassive black hole. And we have a very massive cloud called such V2 here. And this is also another massive cloud called such, such C here, uh, and also many other uh, molecular uh, clouds. They kind of forms a um, twisted ring, a tor torus-like thing, like this, uh, centered on the um, roughly the position of uh, such a star. And, but uh, besides these smaller uh, rings, there are also a, a larger scale uh, rings uh, that's the molecular uh, uh, materials um, distributed along that larger ring. And this is called the X2 ring, and that larger ring is called uh, X1 ring. Um, this is the projected distance, but actual distance would be uh, probably like 400 parsec, uh, 400 parsec for this smaller ring, and for the larger ring, it would extend up to 1,000 parsec, 1 kpc. Uh, for comparison, this is the Suzaku 6.4, KV map. So actually, these clouds uh, are also very bright in X-rays. Um, they generate a very uh, bright 6.4 KV iron KF line and also a continuum emission up to 100 KV. This is the such V2, such C, and such a complex. Uh, and there has been many discussion over the years on what is the origin for the X-ray emissions from these molecular clouds. And uh, the most popular 
scenario is that this is due to X-ray reflection of a past um, outburst, X-ray outburst from such a star. Uh, that is because we have observed the time variability in the uh, iron calf line and also X-ray continuum emission uh, for many of these clouds. Um, depending on whether the wavefront of that outburst from such a star is passing or has passed uh, uh, the, the cloud, you, you can see the X-ray emission from these clouds rising and then a plateau and then decreasing. Um, so that, that, that is just a, a cartoon showing, this, uh, showing like the X-ray reflection scenario and what is the physical processes involved in this uh, scenario. Uh, but not all clouds are showing this uh, X-ray uh, time variability. Um, some uh, do show some con quite constant uh, emission. So the uh, kind of like a competing uh, scenario trying to explain the X-ray emission from these molecular clouds is the cosmic ray a proton or electron bombardment within the uh, uh, clouds, but the energy should be in MeV to GeV. Uh, and they could also generate iron KF line and also the um, continuum emission. Uh, but since their cooling times are very long, uh, for us it would look like a, uh, just a constant X-ray emission. And uh, one uh, good opportunity for us to uh, investigate this cosmic ray bombardment scenario is to look at uh, SAT-V2 uh, this year or next year. Uh, that's because like SAT-V2, uh, which is uh, the most massive and densest uh, cloud in the central molecular zone, uh, its uh, iron k alpha flux and also the continuum emission has been uh, decaying over the last decade. So it's, uh, people kind of, it's widely accepted that this is uh, dominated by the X-ray reflection of a past X-ray outburst from such a star around like, about like 100 years ago. Um, but this component is uh, decaying if we just uh, uh, fit the, um, these uh, measurements uh, for the past uh, decade. Uh, it's uh, uh, cons consistent with either a like, linear decay to maybe zero flux in this year in 2017 or it's also kind of like uh, fitted with uh, exponential decay uh, with a constant uh, background uh, component. And the exponential decay, by the way, is more consistent with uh, what one would expe expect for the long time light curve uh, for the uh, actual reflection scenario. So if this model is preferred, then we would uh, expect a, a constant uh, background component which might be, uh, which could be due to um, the cosmic ray um, bombardment. Um, so uh, starting like this year in 2017, it could be the, the first time that the cosmic ray bombardment component, component would dominate the X-ray emission from such B2. Uh, since I, I, I got like 100 kilosecond XM observation coming up later this year or earlier next year, uh, hopefully uh, it c could at least give us a, a, a upper limit or, or maybe even better constraints on the uh, cosmic ray um, power and even spectrum. Uh, actually, using, even using the earlier data, earlier 2017 uh, uh, data obtained by NewStar, we've already tried to apply the uh, self-consistent uh, cosmic ray proton bombardment model onto the X-ray data from uh, SAT-V2. Uh, this model actually cannot be uh, ruled out, uh, which uh, that this spectrum comes from uh, this measurement here by Newstar, and these are earlier measurements by X-Men Newton. Um, so even with uh, 2013 data, the cosmic ray proton model cannot be ruled out, from which we can uh, infer the required proton uh, power, although it's kind of high, and the ionization rate, which it turns out to be reasonable in the galaxy center area, we can also <laughs> infer the cosmic ray proton uh, spectrum. Um, although the, in the 2013 data could be theoretically 50% uh, from the X reflection and 50% from the cosmic ray. So we were hoping that the uh, new, new data th uh, coming up this year could give us a better control, uh, uh, constraint. Uh, that, that's not the end of the story. 
Um, for sub B2, that is, that's only a, a one case. Uh, that's a good opportunity for us to put some good constraints this year. Uh, but my last point is that um, um, there is also a, a molecular uh, cloud distribution in a larger scale, uh, as shown in that uh, a huge uh, ellipse there. Um, the molecular clouds can uh, extend up to like 1.3 kpc. Um, and the, like the, that dense cloud, Banyas clump two, and also other molecular materials along that large uh, X1 orbit. And the Suzaku observation of these uh, molecular clouds further away from the center, uh, as shown here, uh, they found out that the Aaron K-alpha, the 6.4 kb Aaron K-alpha line, uh, traces uh, these molecular clouds. And actually the intensity as shown in this image, the intensity of the iron careful line uh, is proportional to the density of the molecules uh, along the galactic plane. Um, so if the uh, iron careful line, or uh, maybe also other, also uh, continuum X-ray emission from those clouds <laughs> on the larger scale is also due to X-ray reflection, then it would require a much more powerful extra outburst from star, a star. Star star basis has to go up to its Addington luminosity. And also the outburst should happen like a thousand years ago. So th this makes, uh, makes this actually reflection scenario sounds a little bit artificial because there's not too many evidence um, uh, to, to support that star star could go into, uh, could, could reach its Addington luminosity a thousand years ago. Um, so at this stage, I would think that the cosmic ray, uh, either electron or protons, in the energy of MeV to GeV, um, should be a more a natural explanation for the X-ray emissions from this uh, cloud. But there is only one Suzaku measurement for this cloud. Uh, I, I'm hoping to have some future um, measurements uh, New, new data coming in to see, at least to see whether we see some time variability uh, from the X-ray emissions uh, of these clouds to distinguish between the reflection scenario and the cosmic ray uh, scenario. Um, so that's, uh, that's all I'd like to talk about. Here's just the conclusion. Basically, we can, uh, we, we, we can use the uh, giant molecular clouds and these magnetic uh, filamentary structures to probe different populations of the cosmic ray particles in the galaxy center. And the ultimate goal would be to answer the question of whether there is uh, high energy cosmic ray particles in the center and what uh, could be the uh, accelerator or uh, origin for such uh, high energy cosmic ray particles. Yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you. The Sophia forecast image of Sagittarius A star, it's well known, published by Lau and collaborators two years ago, um, of course showed a pattern of filaments, the radio astronomers in the black hole group, the black hole and red horizon group, call it asymmetrical structure at the galactic center object. Do the filaments seen in the 30 micron detection by Sophia agree with the filaments you're seeing uh, in PEV, protons, or something. You mean the distribution of the filaments uh, of the, as Sophia detected, is it uh, like uh, of a similar distribution as the radio, as seen in radio or X-ray? Uh, it's, it's different from seen in X-ray as far as I know. Yeah. But usually people do not show much care in being sure that their maps have north exactly up and, uh, up and down. And um, the okay. filaments are especially bright in the near infrared and seem to be dominated by um, um, synchrotron radiation as seen by the strong polarization symmetry. Mm -hmm. Circular left and right and linear polarization. Huh. So I'm wondering if, uh, if uh, those filaments and they're called, called by Lao and all the normal, the northern arm east-west arm, and so on. And I'm wondering if those are the same structures as you see uh, in um, cosmic rays. I'm not exactly sure whether uh, the, these near-infrared uh, 
filaments are the counterparts of those radial filaments. The um, scales are about the same. They yeah, show I see. filaments on a size scale of approximately a parsec. Okay. I mean, I would um, I would like to do like a careful comparison because I really haven't really compared the like near infrared. Thanks very much for the <laughs> comments. I'm very interested in this. Um, yeah, indeed, I have to see what is the how how they like uh, is is that are those fi uh, infrared uh, filaments are indeed like uh, counterparts of those and are they of the similar origin? That would be very interesting questions for me to pursue. Thanks. Yes, Tony. How does the flux of cosmic rays compare to the flux of cosmic rays in the solar neighborhood? The flux of, uh, we just calculate like the required like power and like yeah. spectrum. The required power is quite high uh, in the order of like 10 to 39 um, if we are using the most recent uh, observation. Um, oh, the number is uh, like not on top of my head uh, in terms of energy, like how many EV per centimeter square. Um, now, certainly the nearby molecular clouds don't glow quite so bright. Yeah. So I would probably think it's so much higher, much higher, using the current data compared to the uh, solar neighborhood. I would just like a. Like, uh, it's like due to um, PP interaction, and uh, what's, what dominates the GEV and TV emission is pi zero decay. Yes. Yes. The intensity of the TV emission uh, is tracing the distribution of the molecular materials. Yeah. And uh, how do you explain the uh, even one filament could be approaching the petastrom or whatever? Is that some sort of refractional bias or energy is too high for this uh, rare, rare, rare? Right. So first, I think, um, like for this one, we, we luckily, th this guy has the radio counterpart. Mm -hmm. uh, and the radio morphology kind of uh, really goes against the PWM scenario and supporting the filament scenario. For, so for those uh, X-ray filaments with, uh, with the radio counterparts, uh, then we can maybe use the radio observations to, to argue for the magnetic filament scenario. But not too many of them have radio counterparts. Uh, from, radio, uh, uh, from the X-ray observation uh, itself, it's really very difficult to distinguish between PWM scenario and uh, magnetic filaments scenario. Yeah, but we might need a deeper uh, observation or even like X-ray polarization detection. But yeah, X-ray polarization, I don't know, probably not. Okay, thanks for the speakers. Thank you.